Hello viewers, uh, welcome to this course on mathematical finance. Uh, today's lecture is going to be the 12th lecture and it is going to be the last lecture of module 3 uh, where we will look at certain implications of the uh, capital market line and the capital asset pricing model uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, carrying out performance analysis uh, particularly in case of uh, assets and this will show us the practical applicability of CML and CAPM and also we will uh, look at a formulation uh, resulting from the offshoot of the CAPM uh, to justify the usage of the nomenclature that this is going to be an asset pricing model. So, accordingly we start this lecture. So, as I said this is going to be on CML, CAPM and performance analysis. So, we begin with a, a recap of what we have done in the last couple of lectures. So, recall that the inclusion of a risk free asset renders the mean variance efficient frontier that we had seen uh, when we were considering only a portfolio of risky assets. So, this efficient frontier that we had seen earlier and then had included the risk free asset is leads to a straight line which will pass through two portfolios namely the one which is exclusively of the risk free asset and the other which was the market portfolio M and this connected the point 0 R where R was the risk free rate and sigma M mu M where sigma M and mu M where the risk can uh, return of the market portfolio respectively in the sigma mu plane. Now, further uh, we had seen that for any efficient portfolio sigma mu on this line that is the line connecting 0 r and uh, sigma and mu m uh, which you called as the CML satisfies mu is equal to r plus mu m minus r over sigma m into sigma. So, to illustrate this uh, we consider a little example as follows. We consider a project whose uh, and I consider the project over a one year horizon. So, accordingly whose one year expected return and risk and by risk I mean the standard deviation of returns are given by 16 percent and 50 percent respectively. The risk free rate 
is 5 percent. Further, for the market portfolio M, the expected return that means is characteristic on the mu sigma plane and risk again given by the standard deviation are given by 9.5 percent and 15 percent. If the project is on the CML, then what will you get? So, here uh, let us identify what the, uh, the parameters are. So, we look at the expected return and risk for the project to be 16 and 50 percent. So, here sigma is going to be equal to 0 0.50, the risk free rate is 5 percent. So, that means R is going to be 0 0.05 and the expected return and risk in case of the market portfolio that is given by. So, that means mu m which is 9.5 percent will be 0 0.095 and sigma m which is 15 percent is going to be 0 0.15. Now, if we are if this was on the, C, on the CML then I would have mu is equal to 0 0.05 which is the R plus mu m which is 0 0.095 minus R which is 0 0.05 divided by sigma m which is 0 0.15 multiplied by the sigma which is 0 0.50 and this is going to be equal to 0 0.2 or 20 percent which essentially contradicts that mu is equal to 16 percent. So, hence this particular project that we have this is not on the capital market line. Okay, uh, so this was just a slight background uh, a recap of what we have done in case of uh, the CML. Now, let us go back to our uh, CAPM framework. So, recall that in CAPM uh, we stated the following that is that in equilibrium uh, the expected return mu i for any asset i will satisfy mu i is equal to r i which is the risk free rate into beta i that is beta of the asset multiplied by mu m minus r where you would recall that beta i is equal to sigma i m divided by sigma m square. Uh, so, here I just want to make an observation that this particular term uh, mu i minus r this is basically the expected excess rate of return and by expected excess I basically mean that this is excess over the risk free rate which is R. So, let us now uh, use this to get some interpretation of the CAPM. So, the interpretation of the CAPM is that the expected rate of return of an asset 
uh, rather expected excess rate of return that means this term of an asset is equal to the product of its beta with the expected excess rate of return of the market portfolio. Uh, so, to put it explicitly, uh, I will make use of this relation and what it says is that this mu y minus r which is the expected excess rate of return of an asset, this is going to be equal to the product of the beta into the expected excess rate of return of the market portfolio which is mu m minus r. Now, we recall that uh, for a single period model, say we consider the two time periods 0 and 1 and uh, suppose the stock price at z uh, time 0 is S0 which is known and the uh, stock price at time 1 uh, is S1 which is a random quantity. Then and suppose you, uh, you put the subscript i for the ith asset then the return for the ith asset is simply going to be S i of 1 minus S i of 0 that is the net profit or loss that you make as a percentage of the original price and then this is the return of the asset i. Now, we uh, define uh, two quantities uh, motivated by uh, the excess return of the asset and the excess return of the market portfolio over the risk free rate and we define a new variable r i which I will define as r i minus r which is the excess security i return. and uh, small r m to be r m minus r which is the excess market return. Now, uh, this leads us to uh, the so called quote unquote linear regression model connecting R i and R m as follows. We will write this as R i is equal to some A i. So, I am basically trying to find a linear relation that will connect my R i with R m. So, this will be R i is equal to A i plus B i R m plus epsilon i where a i and b i are to be determined and where epsilon i is basically the random error term. So, this is obviously a random quantity. Uh, so, accordingly we define uh, sigma epsilon i to be the standard deviation of this random error term epsilon i. Now, note that it is assumed that epsilon i's are independent and their means that is expected value of epsilon i these are going to be equal to 0. So, in this case 
uh, you can make use of this particular relation that we have done here. Take expectation on both the sides and uh, make a comparison uh, with the cap m and what you will be able to achieve is the following that in this case we will get that b i is going to be equal to beta i and the prediction of cap m is that in equilibrium a i going to be equal to 0. So, what I do is now uh, since r i is suggestive of the return it gives the basically the excess return for each individual asset um, in, in terms of the excess return that we have for the market portfolio. So, we need to look at uh, what is going to be the expected risk in this case uh, the, the expected return and more importantly we need to see uh, basically the volatility that is expected by R i uh, and also see how it actually fares with the market excess return of R m. And so accordingly what we will do is that we will take the covariance of uh, small r i and small r m. And this is necessary because you want to figure out what is going to be the beta. So, accordingly sigma i m which is this covariance of r i and r m this is simply going to be covariance. So, this is covariance of r i and r m this can be written as what is r i. So, covariance of r i remember here we had got the a i to be equal to 0 and b i to be equal to beta i. So, accordingly this is going to be r i will be replaced by uh, beta i into uh, r m plus epsilon i uh, this covariance with r m. And so, if you use the properties of covariance this is going to be beta i of covariance of r m comma r m plus covariance of epsilon i r m. And what is this going to be? By assumption this term this is going to be equal to 0 and this is simply going to be sigma m squared the variance of the excess market return and this is simply going to be beta i into sigma m square. Okay. Accordingly, uh, so further uh, in addition to looking at the covariances of r i and r m, we further get a variance of uh, r i to be equal to variance of beta i r m plus epsilon i and this is going to be using the properties of variance this is going to be a variance of beta i r m plus variance of epsilon i plus a covariance of uh, epsilon i r m. Uh, so, this is going to be beta i into a uh, variance of r m which is sigma m square uh, variance of epsilon i you have already defined this to be sigma square epsilon i and uh, covariance of epsilon i and r m we have already seen this to be equal to 0. So, what you end up getting is basically uh, a decomposition of variance of r i into two terms. So, let us examine this in a little more detail. Uh, that I have got sigma i square is equal to beta i square uh, this is going to be beta i square sigma m square plus sigma square epsilon i. So, this can be said that uh, this can be interpreted as variance of a security i that means this term k 
can be decomposed into two parts right namely this part beta i square sigma m square and sigma square epsilon i so the first part that is beta i square sigma m square this is the part of the risk that means the part of sigma i square risk of the security that is related to the market m through its beta and sometimes this is what is known as or called as market or systematic that means something that is related to the system as a whole some kind of a global factor. So, this is what is known as the market or the systematic risk. So, this is the market or the systematic risk and secondly we have this term sigma square epsilon i and this is what is known as uh, the specific uh, or non systematic risk. So, this means that the overall risk of the port uh, of the of the asset is basically a composition of the risk that is arising from its interaction with the market as seen through this term containing beta 1 uh, in addition to uh, something that is endemic or idiosyncratic or just locally specific to this individual assets. And this is you recall what you call this as this is what is known as the uh, diversifiable risk a part of the risk and this is what is known as the non diversifiable part of the risk. Okay, uh, now, let us uh, uh, dig a little deeper into this and illustrate this uh, whatever you have discussed in terms of cap m uh, as well as the, the systematic and the non systematic risk uh, through an example. So, the example is the following we consider the market portfolio. Uh, with the two uh, uh, parameters that means with the expected return and risk that means your uh, standard deviation being. So, we take the expected return to be say 11 percent and the risk to be 20 percent respectively. Now, we considered uh, two assets uh, call them asset 1 and asset 2. So, for asset 1 the expected return of asset 1 is a 6 percent and the expected return of asset 2 is a 10 percent with risk as given by standard deviation of 18 percent. All right. So, now we take these two assets and construct a portfolio out of it. So, we construct a portfolio of uh, asset 1 and asset 2 with half and half investment uh, that is uh, w 1 is equal to half the weight and w 2 is going to be equal to half. Further uh, we have the portfolio beta 
is equal to 0 0.5 and the question is what is the specific or non-systematic risk for asset 2 in CAPM framework. So, let us try to answer these questions in the CAPM framework. So, here uh, we have W1 equal to half and W2 also equal to half. Then uh, we have beta 1 and beta 2 be the betas of the two assets. So, then the beta for the portfolio is going to be W1 beta 1 and it is left as an exercise for you to prove that this is true. You just make use of the definition of covariance and uh, uh, the, the properties of uh, covariance. So, this will give me that the beta of the portfolio is 0 0.5. So, this will be 0 0.5 is equal to 0 0.5 that is half beta 1 plus 0 0.5 into beta 2 which leads to uh, the relationship that beta 1 plus beta 2 is equal to 1 uh, that is I can write beta 1 is equal to 1 minus beta 2. So, now I will invoke uh, cap m for both asset 1 and asset 2. So, for asset 1, I will have what well for what asset 1, what was the return? Return was 6 percent. So, accordingly for asset 1, I will have 0 0.06 minus the risk free rate is equal to beta 1, which is 1 minus beta 2 into the excess return, expected return of the market portfolio. So, which was 11 percent and uh, 20 percent, which can be obtained from these two numbers. So, this is basically going to be uh, 0 0.11 minus r and for asset 2 you would see go back and see that uh, the expected return was 10 percent. So, this is going to be 0 0.10 minus r is equal to beta 2 into again the excess uh, expected return on the market portfolio which is 0 0.11 minus r. So, you solve this, uh, you can add them up to obtain r and then uh, consequently beta 2. We solve this to get r is equal to 0 0.05 or 5 percent and beta 2 is going to be equal to 5 over 6. So, then what was my question? My question was what is going to be the specific risk for asset 2? So, uh, this means that I am trying to figure out what is going to be my sigma epsilon 2 square right Th that is the thing I want to figure out. So, then uh, we will get sig we will make use of the formula for sigma i square. So, sigma 2 square will then become beta 2 square sigma m square plus sigma square epsilon 2. So, I am just basically uh, making use of uh, this relation for i equal to 2. So, this means that what is sigma 2? Sigma 2 is the risk for the second asset. Go back, what is the risk for the sec, uh, second asset? It was 18 percent. So, accordingly uh, what I can do is, so this will give me sigma square epsilon 2 is uh, sigma 2 square minus beta 2 square sigma m square. Sigma 2 is 18 percent. So, this is going to be 0 0.18 uh, square minus beta 2 is 5 over 6. So, this is going to be 5 over 6 square and what is sigma m? Sigma m was 20 percent here. So, this is going to be 0 0.2 square and this turns out to be equal to 0 0.04 uh, 0 0.0046. So, this is what is going to be the uh, specific risk or the non-systematic risk for asset 2. All right. Uh, so, let us now move on to an application of uh, CMN and CAPM uh, in the 
from the point of view of performance analysis, that means suppose you have two assets and uh, or two portfolios, and how can we make use of the CAPM framework? Uh, and in particular, uh, the risk of each of the assets uh, and and uh, the betas of the asset, or equivalently for the portfolios, in order to make a comparative analysis uh, of uh, preferring one particular investment in an asset over other. So, this uh, is what is known as the performance evaluation. So, what the performance evaluation does, uh, the purpose it serves is that uh, this model and remember that we will work in the CAPM framework. So, this model gives a benchmark or some sort of uh, a criteria or a test to evaluate securities and decide whether the price of the security or the asset is correct or whether they are incorrect uh, in terms of being uh, overvalued or undervalued. So, this will sort of give you the justification for uh, uh, the usage of the term capital asset pricing model. So, to this end, uh, we will look at basically three uh, index or uh, measures for performance. So, one is the Zensen's index, the second is the trainer index and the third is sharp index or sharp ratio. So, uh, we first start off with the Zensen's index. So, consider a uh, a regression time model uh, say r i is equal to alpha i plus beta i r m with a hat where uh, so, I put the head because these are values that are going to be estimated based on the empirical data. So, these are going to be based on empirical data that means past historical data. So, here beta i is the estimate of beta for security i or the asset i, r i hat is the mean return of security i and r m hat is going to be the uh, market average estimated return. So, this is the estimation of the average market return. Uh, typically, you would be looking at uh, some sort of a market index. Uh, to make this estimation. All right. Uh, so, here we have seen that okay, fine we have uh, defined what is r i hat, beta i hat and r m hat and these are estimated. So, then uh, from, from this relation what you get is that uh, alpha i hat is going to be r i hat minus beta i hat minus into r m hat is. Uh, so, this relation r i hat minus beta i hat r m hat uh, is going to be the uh, estimate of the true alpha which is a measure of overpricing. So, sometimes this Zensen's uh, uh, index is also known as Zensen's alpha because of this term because uh, this is the one which will actually do a performance analysis. So, which is a measure of overpricing or 
under pricing of the uh, security. So, uh, in case of CAPM, uh, your alpha i obviously is going to be equal to 0. Now, however, uh, we need to explore the possibilities of alpha i being positive uh, or negative. So, accordingly, we look at each of those subcases individually. So, if alpha i had the estimate for alpha is greater than 0, this means that the security seems to be paying right, on an average a return that exceeds the return it should pay in the CAPM equilibrium. By this I mean the following that uh, if, if you go back and look at this here, uh, now ideally if uh, alpha should be equal to 0, but uh, if your alpha is positive that means that say in equilibrium state your return will be beta i into R m. However, the return you are getting has an additional term alpha i. So, which means that if this is positive that means your return actually exceeds the return that you expect from the CAPM framework. So, that means it is actually performing better than you expect from the uh, in case of a CAPM equilibrium. And uh, in case your alpha hat uh, alpha i hat is less than 0, then the security seems to be underperforming. So, what is the, uh, what is the uh, fallout of uh, these particular two observations that we have made here? The fallout here is that uh, the, and this is given in terms of this parameter alpha hat. So, the parameter alpha uh, or its estimate given by a hat is uh, called Jensen's index or Jensen's alpha. And it says the following that if your alpha greater than 0, then the security is performing better than what CAPM would predict. And accordingly, this means that the security is actually underpriced. And if alpha is less than 0, that means uh, the security is actually performing worse than it should. Uh, as you would expect it to happen in case of CAPM and consequently we say that the security is going to be overpriced. Now, we have stated what is the Zensus index or the Zensus alpha. Now, let us just uh, point out uh, uh, a particular drawback uh, regarding the usage of the Zensus index. So, a drawback of this index is the following that uh, the Zensus index uh, does not give an indication of the actual risk level of the security. Uh, so, for example, uh, to just to illustrate this point or drive home the point. Uh, that suppose alpha is greater than 0 uh, and uh, they are same for two securities. So, it should not suggest to you that they are equally attractive in terms of investments uh, because you also need to look at uh, the possibility that the beta i's are different. And obviously, in this case, uh, the one with lower beta i is more attractive from the point of view of the investment. Okay, so, we have uh, taken care of the Zensen's index. Let us now move on to trainer index. 
So, let us start off with this uh, particular index and the trainer index which will is usually denoted by T i for the i at the set is defined as mu i minus r over beta i. So, this is like an excess return over risk kind of a thing uh, except that your beta i is just the risk of the uh, suggestive of the risk associated with the market where uh, mu i minus r is the uh, as you recall is the expected excess return of security i. Now, uh, if the trainer index of a given security is greater than the trainer index mu m minus r. Uh, remember that in case of a, a market portfolio, what would be the trainer index? The trainer index is going to be mu m minus r over beta m and beta m is just going to be equal to 1. So, in this case the trainer index, so in case the trainer index T i of the asset is greater than the trainer index mu m minus r uh, of the market portfolio, then what you get is that uh, you can say that then the security uh, is actually performing better than it should according to CAPM. Right. So, according to CAPM you are actually expecting uh, that uh, uh, the trainer index will be mu m minus r to be equal to mu m minus r. Uh, so, uh, essentially this means that if your trainer index for the asset turns out to be bigger than this. So, it is obviously suggestive that uh, the performance of the individual asset as measured by the trainer index uh, is actually better than the performance uh, as would be suggested by the CAPM framework. Okay, now, uh, just an observation here again. Uh, Trainer index is something that is actually uh, not applicable in a blanket fashion, but is uh, uh, has some sort of a rider uh, that comes along with it or the condition that it has to be a uh, diversified portfolio. And uh, we accordingly make the observation regarding this uh, diversification necessary in case of, uh, of a trainer index. So, uh, this observation is that uh, diversification uh, in case of trainer ratio is necessary uh, since a security uh, with good performance vis-a-vis uh, -vis CAPM as the benchmark as we as given in case of a trainer index uh, might actually have high specific risk which will not go away if the portfolio is not well diversified. So, it is with this uh, uh, shortcoming that we actually go on and define our uh, uh, third performance measure uh, na namely the uh, sharp index or the sharp ratio. So, the third one is uh, the sharp index or sharp ratio. 
which will denote by SI for the ith asset and it is defined as SI is equal to mu i minus r over sigma i. Uh, so, the interpretation is that the higher the sharp index, index, the better the security is in the mean variance sense. Right? I mean you can view this by just recalling that uh, mu i mu minus r uh, over sigma uh, is going to be mu m minus r over sigma m. So, that means the higher you have this term uh, ideally more than mu m minus r over sigma uh, the better it is uh, that the particular asset is actually performing well. Okay, so, uh, we have looked at these three different ratios Zensex, uh, Zensen, Strainer and uh, Sharp ratio. So, we just summarize uh, whatever we have uh, seen so far. So, if we have a good Zensen index, uh, typically this will mean uh, on both sides that you will have a good trainer in the, uh, ratio or the good trainer ratio both ways. Uh, secondly, uh, so obviously a fallout of this statement, the first statement is that a bad Zensen index will mean a bad trainer index or ratio and vice versa. Uh, the third observation is that uh, good sharp ratio implies good trainer, but good trainer can happen with bad sharp uh, and likewise bad trainer implies bad sharp but a bad sharp can occur with good trainer. Uh, anyway, I mean th these two statements are sort of you can reconcile these two statements. Uh, and you can of course uh, reconcile these two particular uh, statements. So, now we actually come to uh, the last topic as uh, that is uh, viewing the cap m or uh, and the CML in the context of an asset pricing model. So, we will give a couple of formulas that are actually obviously derivable from uh, the relation for cap m. So, let us look at the pricing formulas first one. Now, you recall that uh, uh, again we look at the single period model. So, then the return is going to be or the expected return is going to be E s 1 minus s 0 over s 0 which will denote by mu and this uh, according to cap m this is going to be r plus beta into mu m minus r okay? which means that E s 1 is equal to s 0. So, I am just basically combining these two terms into 1 plus r plus beta into mu m minus r. And what this gives you is that s 0 is going to be E of s uh, 1, this is s 1 divided by 1 plus r plus beta into mu m minus r. So, the interpretation of this is the following that today's today's asset price 
is going to be equal to that means S0 is going to be equal to the expected future price that means E of S1 discounted by this particular factor 1 plus R plus beta into mu m minus R. So, you see now out of the formula uh, cap m formula we are now able to actually get a pricing formula. Uh, a second uh, pricing formula would be like uh, beta is going to be sigma beta i is sigma i m over sigma m square you would recall the definition of beta i. So, if I call my beta i to be beta so this becomes beta sigma m square is equal to sigma i m and this is going to be the covariance of r i and r m by definition. Now, what is r i? r i in a single period model is just going to be S i over S 0 minus 1 right. R i is what S 1 minus S 0 over S 0 and this is S 1 over S 0 minus 1. And the covariance of the, this random variable with R m this can be written as covariance of S 1 and R m over S 0 for the first term minus covariance of 1 comma R m. So, covariance of uh, deterministic quantity with the random variable is obviously going to be equal to 0. So, therefore, if we replace this value for beta uh, in, in the in the previous relation that we have here, then we obtain that S 0 is going to be equal to 1 divided by 1 plus r into E of S 1 minus 1 over sigma m square into covariance of S 1 r m into mu m minus r. So, we get another pricing formula in a different form. So, this brings us uh, to the end of the discussion on module 3 which was on portfolio theory. Uh, just to do recap of the model, we started off with defining what a portfolio is. Uh, we then moved on to uh, the Markowitz framework where we considered a portfolio comprising of completely risky assets and we looked at what is the efficient frontier uh, corresponding to all those portfolios uh, which are uh, either the minimum variance portfolio or the minimum variance portfolio for a given amount of return pre-assigned returns or uh, the portfolio which gives the minimum uh, which uh, uh, gives uh, the maximum return for a predetermined value of, uh, of risk. And then we added a risk free portfolio to this portfolio of risky assets uh, to obtain the efficient frontier and henceforth uh, give the CML uh, and the CAPM framework. And then we saw how uh, this can be actually used to measure the performance uh, of assets and portfolios in terms of uh, several well established ratios. Uh, and we finally concluded by talking about uh, a couple of pricing formulation. Uh, that arises out of the CAPM framework. Thank you for watching.